to all dads raising a child with special needs. Mark your calendar and plan to attend the Special Fathers Network Dads Virtual Conference, Saturday, May 14th. It's a must-attend event for dads looking to learn about the Special Fathers Network, to meet other dads, to gather resources, develop skills, and network with other like-minded dads. Register today at 21stCenturyDads.org. Special thanks to Horizon Therapeutics for sponsoring the Special Fathers Network Dad to Dad podcast. Working tirelessly to research, develop, and bring forward medicines for people living with rare and rheumatic diseases. Discover more about Horizon Therapeutics mission at horizontherapeutics.com. Because one, I loved working with children. And then when I started working with children with special needs, it, it, was, it was just amazing. My own mother also became disabled. And the mom can't walk. She can't put her feet in front of the other. She drags them so she can't go anywhere. I'm her feet. I take her everywhere she needs to go. And so this, this has brought me very close to persons with disabilities because I understand it firsthand from my home and to people that I experienced growing up. That's our guest this week, Jeremiah Curia, a businessman originally from Kenya who co-founded a global lifestyle brand providing economic security to hundreds of women worldwide. We'll hear Jeremiah's story and more about his life's work on this Special Fathers Network Dad to Dad podcast. Say hello to host David Hirsch. Hi, and thanks for listening to the Dad to Dad podcast, Fathers Mentoring Fathers of Children with Special Needs. Presented by the Special Fathers Network. The Special Fathers Network is a dad-to-dad mentoring program for fathers raising children with special needs. Through our personalized matching process, new fathers with special needs children connect with mentor fathers in a similar situation. It's a great way for dads to support dads. To find out more, go to 21stCenturyDads.org. And if you're a dad looking for help or would like to offer help, we'd be honored to have you join our closed Facebook group please go to facebook.com groups and search dad to dad. Now let's listen to this fascinating conversation between Jeremiah Curia and David Hirsch. I'm thrilled to be talking today with Jeremiah Curia of Mai Mahu, Kenya in Africa, a father of three children and co-founder of Ubuntu, a non-governmental organization and global lifestyle brand that provides economic security to hundreds of women raising children with special needs through the manufacturing of crafts and gift items sold around the world. Jeremiah, thank you for doing a podcast interview for the Special Fathers Network. Yeah, I'm, I'm glad. I, I'm glad we could do this. You and your wife, Mary, have been married for 30 years and are the proud parents of three children, Hannah, 34, Grace, 28, and Eric, 24. Let's start with some background. Where did you grow up? Tell me something about your family. Yeah, I was born and raised in a small village called Escarpment. And uh, Escarpment is, uh, I would say, about 30 miles uh, north of Nairobi and overlooking the Great Lift Valley. That's where I was born, to the primary school there. And then for my high school, I would go through the viewpoint area, six kilometers walk to my high school. So, and born as the firstborn. And yeah, I, I'm, I'm glad to be the firstborn <laughs> as the leader of the family. <laughs> That's fabulous. So I'm sort of curious to know, what did your dad do for a living? Yeah, the only time I remember my dad working is before I was kind of self-aware. He worked in a vegetable processing company. That's when he was employed. When I was born and even when I was about to uh, join primary school, my parents moved now to escarpment because the vegetable processing was in Naivasha town. And uh, there he started a restaurant business, which he ran until I graduated from high school. And then I helped him for a year before I joined Bible College. And how would you describe your relationship with your dad? Uh, my relationship with dad has been interesting, I would say. <laughs> one, because my dad was very strict as he grew up. Uh, so he would walk in through one door and me and my brothers would exit the next. 
And so he wanted the best for us. He wanted us to be very disciplined. He wanted us to be the best kids. But I think being the firstborn, like any other parents, it's like trial and error. He doesn't even know what to do with you. <laughs> so I wouldn't say I had like a great relationship like a father-son. But I knew what my father wanted of me. That, that, that's how I describe it. And I came back around after graduating from college. And now we are good friends with my dad. Yeah, I, I always check out on him. He has different names for me. When he needs something from me, there's a name. And when he wants to talk about family, he would be called me the father of Anne and all those kind of details, which is amazing. Yeah, well, thanks for sharing. Yes. It sounds like he had a good work ethic. Yeah. And he was very disciplined. Yes. And he had high expectations for you and your brothers and sisters. Very high expectations. Very high expectations. That's right. So what do you think the most important takeaways were from your relationship with your dad? Perhaps something that you've tried to incorporate into your own fathering? I would say, just like you said, good work ethics. He, he cared so much about the community and the relationship with community. So he wanted uh, you to be in the best behavior because he values uh, somebody being uh, somebody in the community. And so I also get it from him living for other people because my dad will leave his own work and go help other people. So I've learned that from him that we have a higher purpose and there's also a great purpose in helping that those that live with us. So those are some of the, the values that I've got from him. Working hard was the thing. Nowadays, it's working smart, but uh, working hard was the thing. I remember him telling me that we need to dig this ground until we plant potatoes. And he would be with there with us and making sure that we are doing it the, the right way. So quite amazing. Yeah, well, thanks for sharing. Well, I'm sort of curious to know what, if any, relationship you had with your grandfathers first on your dad's side and then on your mom's side. Yeah, my grandfather, mom's side, was a bishop of our church. And so lots of spiritual stuff. He's the one who taught me how to read the Bible and make sure that I'm reading it the way it's written and wanted me to learn how to read it in our language. So that was amazing. I remember him telling me to read Galatians 4 about the inheritance. Like you cannot get your inheritance even if it's yours, if you are a baby. You have to wait, be, wait until you mature. And I couldn't read that in our language, so he made sure that I got that one right. And then uh, he always wanted to make sure that you understand right and wrong and making sure that you don't intentionally wrong others and learning to say sorry. Very spiritual stuff that I, I learned from my, my grandfather of the mother's side. My grandfather, father's side, on the other hand, was an assistant chief. They used to call them the head man of the village. He was the head man of that village. Very highly respected. His name was Jeremiah. I'm named after him. And uh, even though I would have wanted to change my name, I couldn't change my name because Jeremiah was the name that the people respected in the village. And uh, yeah, what I remember most about my grandfather is that uh, even if I lose in a pen or anything from school, I didn't run to my dad. I ran to my grandfather. Loved me dearly, wanted the best for me, wanted me to be well educated. So proud of me. I remember wearing the, the, the hat. Those, those days they used to wear hats like with a crown, like the police officers. That's what the assistant chiefs used to wear. So I was so proud wearing that and he loved to see me in that one. So great memories of my grandfather. He was a disciplinarian, not only for his kids, but also for the kids of the village. That's how everybody remembers him. Everything I, I do, people say, hey, you're just like your grandfather, Jeremiah, <laughs> which I, I appreciate a lot. <laughs> well, that's fabulous. And, you know, you were named after him. So there's a special relationship that you have with him yes. versus your siblings or yes. maybe his other grandchildren for that matter. Yes, yes. And I'm the oldest of all the cousins. So I am a firstborn of his firstborn son. So I'm the oldest in all the, the cousins. So, yeah. 
So did you mention in a prior conversation that he had two wives? Yeah, my grandfather had two wives. At the same time? At the same time. Jokingly, they, they call that one a corporal <laughs> <laughs> in the police rank. So you had two ranks. And my grandmother, my dad's mom, was the oldest. And then there was a younger wife at the same time. And so when I when I was aware, self-aware, I remember my grandfather spending lots of time with his younger wife. That's where he would have his meals and everything, and he would tell stories and everything. So, yeah, he has many children. He has 14 children in total. Wow. With these two wives. <laughs> well, that's a, not the custom here in the United States that you no, have two, no. <laughs> two wives at the same time. It's not uncustomary to be married. Yeah. And then if your wife passes away or you get divorced, that you might be remarried. Yeah. But that's one of the cultural differences between where you grew up and what's going on here in the States. Yeah, the, the aspect of polygamy in the African culture mainly, yeah. And does it still exist? exists. It has been discouraged mainly, especially in the Christian circles, because of the emphasis in the Bible, especially if you want to become a leader, you must be a husband of one wife. But the government just allowed that you can have more than one wife customary. So yeah, you can imagine. <laughs> yeah, Many men are saying, yeah, that, that's, that's something. <laughs> but women are like, we don't like this. Yeah, well, it certainly has its pros and cons. Yeah. Obviously, it, you're taking on a lot of responsibility. Completely. Particularly if there's 14 children, right? Yeah. And like you had mentioned. So the way I think about it is be careful what you ask for. Exactly, exactly. I'm thinking about other men who were of influence to you, father figures, if you will, and I'm wondering who comes to mind. The person who comes to mind is Reverend David Gedeye, uh, who I joined after I graduated from Bible College. And he took me as one of his sons and made sure that I know how to understand how to, to, to get into the job. And he made sure that I know you can make a mistake. And once you make a mistake, the only problem is I don't learn from your mistake and don't repeat it again. And uh, so he was very committed to training me. And he would watch me speak and give me feedback after speaking. He would let me lead meetings. And yeah, he, he is a man that I miss. He died like five years ago. And I miss him a lot because of uh, all the input he had in my life. Yeah. Yeah, well, I think you, you can only look backwards and realize, you know, who had that influence. You can only connect the dots looking backwards. Yeah. And it's hard to imagine when you're looking forwards you know, who's going to have the most influence on you. Thank God for people like David Givaye yeah. for the role that they played. Exactly. So my recollection was that you got your initial education at Moffat Bible College in Kajabi. Yeah. And you had degrees in Bible and theology. Yes. And you went to work in a children's home in Kenya for better part of seven or eight years. Nine years, yeah. And then nine years, okay. Yeah. And then you decided to pursue some additional education, but not there in Kenya. And I'm wondering, how is it that you transitioned to going to get your additional degrees in Grand Rapids, Michigan? I remember when I got a job in the children's home, that's why I worked with David Gedeye, the reverend. I remember when I, when I got there, I became very passionate about working with children. And it was always a joy to to serve them. One, because they are in the children's home because they have no parents or they have a single parent or they came from very poor families. And I, I wanted to just support them. And what I did when I was there is I, I was answering every knock on the door. I was running up and down to support and to help. And what happened, I didn't know what was going to happen is I burned out because I was giving too much and not getting anything. So I talked to a friend of mine who was already in Grand Rapids. We grew up together. His name is Isaac. And he told me, I know what you need to do. You need to rejuvenate. 
you know, to well rejuvenate, I know a school you can go to. So he was going to Kuiper College, and then it was Reformed Bible College. And he shared that, oh, this is, this is a school I would want you to join, and it will be amazing for you. So I went there. I applied, did the whole application, looked for the American visa. I couldn't get it for the first three attempts. So after the third year is when I got it. And then finally, it was time to go to to Grand Rapids. And so my connection with Grand Rapids is because there was already somebody there came from my village. Thank you for sharing. And I'm curious to know, was that a cultural shock for you moving from Kenya to the United States? Were there any challenges that you experienced language-wise or culturally? My first shock was ice. <laughs> <laughs> I got off the car. Nobody ever told me that when it's snowing and it was warm a little bit, there is ice. So I got off the car and fall on my back. <laughs> and I tried to stand and I couldn't. <laughs> that was my first shock. And then the, the I came from a small village. Going to a supermarket was even big. And then they take me to this supermarket. I cannot even find anything. I, can, I, I couldn't find anything. So I had to depend on other people to tell me, okay, you need to go to this aisle. Even being told an aisle, <laughs> I was not used to. So language was a barrier. Big things, big thing. Everything in the U.S. was big for me. And uh, not many places you would walk. And then I landed in December. So that's what trying to walk in there. It, I saw sunshine one day and I said, oh, this is a good day to walk. I didn't have the proper gear for, 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 for cold. And so I was so cold. So I had a few cultural shocks. Yes. But after nine years, I got to understand. <laughs> Yeah, well, thanks for sharing. And I'm curious to know, where did Mary come into the picture, your wife? Because you've been married for 30 years and you came to the U.S. in, was it 2001 or 2002? At, at 2001, December. Okay. After two years, Mary and the kids joined me. So, yeah, they couldn't get their visas. We were not trying to look for visas at the beginning, but when I got there... I was missing family and we started looking for ways to be together and lots of efforts to get them to get visas, very difficult. But finally, they got their visas and the kids and they, they, they joined me. That I think it was September, no, April of 2003. Okay. Yeah. And I'm sort of curious to know where along the way did you meet Zane? Zane, we had met well in Kenya. Then we met when in Kenya in the year 2000. My first close American friend. So he he came to Kijabi. It's a mission station where there's lots of missionaries from the U.S. And he he was a med tech there. And then he was left in charge of like an outreach program. He came to drop food to my Mahio children's home where I was working. And he connected with me. I didn't connect with him because I had seen many missionaries come and go. They never returned. They just did what they needed to do and they disappeared. But for Zane, he came back and said, hey, I realize that you have a lot of work here. Do you need help? And I said, I know I need help, but I don't know what kind of help you can offer. So that's when we came up with a brilliant idea of having lunch every Thursday, which we did for, for, for a whole year. So, and that's... I started experiencing a little bit of America there because, but he couldn't tell me. <laughs> he used to come with another missionary lady, very awkward moments. And I would say, hey, I want to eat what she eats because I want to be big like she is. And uh, that was, that was bad. That was bad, bad. <laughs> <laughs> and those are some of the cultural shocks. And he is trying to eat what I'm eating and he doesn't like it. He doesn't want to offend me. So he wouldn't talk about it. We had a few awkward moments, but <laughs> we made it through. Yeah, well, it sounds like you came from different cultures, but there was this bond that you created over a year of having lunch every week for a year. And I'm wondering, where did the idea for creating Ubuntu come as a result of those conversations? 
creating Ubuntu came very organically because we visited lots of homes because he wanted to understand how people live. So I would lead him to go to different homes. When we are going to those homes, we are listening to stories and people kept saying all they need is opportunity. They were not looking for to be given anything. They were looking for opportunities. And so this was getting so much into Zen's uh, heart and his mind. And so we kept wondering, what can we do? What can we do to create opportunities for these people? And then in our, in our efforts is when we met this wonderful group of persons with disabilities. They had formed a group and they invited us to their, to their group. And they said, hey, you guys, you say you help the poorest of the poor. And here we are, but nobody thinks about us. It's like, I think we, we qualify to work with you guys. And, th and that's when it started. Okay. Well, was this the group of women who had children with special needs? Yes, this was a group of women and men who were, some of them were disabled. All, they were mothers to children with special needs. Mothers and fathers with children with special needs. So they had formed a support group to support each other. These guys didn't even have identity cards, so they couldn't even access a hospital because, you know, you have to register. So... <clears throat> And uh, yeah, the first thing we did was to get them identity cards. So, and then they could be recognized in the society and access the, the services that they, they, they need to access. Yeah. So looking back on that, what was your first exposure to individuals with special needs? And my first exposure to children with special needs is when uh, when I was when I was growing up, I remember we had a neighbor. My neighbors, <clears throat> very close friends of ours, and they had a sister who who grew up. I think he, uh, she had some mental retardation or learning disabilities. But I remember her drooling a lot and seeing the siblings not caring, embracing her. And I was like, "Wow, that's 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 different. That's different." And then when I went to primary school, I also engaged another young man who, who just died last year due to COVID, actually. Either this year, I think I think early this year, we are in Naga, so it's early this year. And uh, this boy, uh, also learning disabilities or possibly Down syndrome, I couldn't understand then what was going on with them. Right now is after working with people with disabilities is when I know all these conditions and the differences. So, but Mungai was uh, very happy, very jovial, loved everybody, loved hugging everybody. So he was special that way. And uh, we all embraced him. We loved to feed him because he would appreciate more than anyone else. And uh, he couldn't uh, do school like everybody else, but he was a joy to have around. So you were comfortable being around individuals with disability from a relatively young age. That's what I hear you saying. Yes, completely. Uh, I, I, I always tell everybody it was kind of like a calling because one, I loved working with children. And then when I started working with children with special needs, it, it, was, it was just amazing. My own mother also became disabled. And the mom can't walk. She can't put her feet in front of the other. She drags them so she can't go anywhere. I'm her feet. I take her everywhere she needs to go. And so this, this has brought me very close to persons with disabilities because I understand it firsthand from my home and to people that I experienced growing up. Yeah, well, thanks for sharing. And going back to Ubuntu, yeah. my understanding was that uh, you created a center for children with disability, you know, providing these life-changing therapies and medical care for kids who suffer from physical and social stigma. And did it start out as a grand plan or was it more organic, like you were saying? Well, very, very organic, I would say, because we, the mothers have approached us. I remember Faith. Faith was disabled herself, given birth to three children, very beautiful girl and two handsome young men. And Faith, as disabled as she was, said, my only dream is to see a center for children with special needs. Because when I was growing up, I grew up a lot of, around a lot of stigma and uh, segregation. Nobody knew what to do with me. Nobody cared. And so she was desiring to see a center. So 
We started working with Faith and she mobilized these children and we had nine to begin with. And I still remember that the mothers were struggling even to walk along the streets to bring the children to the center because of shame and embarrassment and to walk behind the streets and find the children to the center. So it started very small, uh, not sure what to do. Very organically, we, we had three women volunteer to cook for these children so that they can have lunch. And not even sure what we actually wanted to do, but here we are, the children need a center so that the mothers can go and do other jobs to take care of their other children. Yeah, and slowly we, we, we started growing from one room and then we rented another room. Currently we have taken over the whole space of different rooms to take care of these children. Yeah. So if I understand what you're saying, getting the moms out of the house, yeah. right where they were taking care of their children and their disabled children who were not well accepted in society yeah. was a liberating experience for them, yeah. right? Because they could get out of the house, their kids could get the attention and medical services that they needed yeah. to grow and develop. Yeah. And then it allowed them to develop a skill and create some economic security yeah. for their families. Completely, completely. And how many women are involved or how many individuals are involved with the work of Ubuntu and what type of work do they actually do? Yeah, when we took the women at the beginning, well, they're the ones who approached us and say, hey, now that you have the children at the center, can you also get us something to do? And like, no, 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 we did sign up for this. <laughs> uh, but it's like, what do you want to do? And they said, we want to learn how to do sewing. We want to learn how to sew. And they had by themselves bought three singer machines, the treadle machines, and they, they couldn't learn how to do it. So we said, okay, bring those machines. They brought the machines. We started training them how to do sewing. And thankfully, we got connected to American Sewing Guild. People who are passionate about sewing, they came, they taught them how to sew aprons, some tots, and pillowcases. Yeah, th th those simple things. And currently, I can say we have over 80 or 85 women who are working at the center. Not all of them with children with special needs, but the majority of them, we have known them because of this community of children with special needs. Where did the idea for Ubuntu and then selling these beyond just the local community, how did that evolve? So staying with uh, these women for two years and uh, they couldn't make anything that you could sell to anybody because <laughs> the bags were twisted and everything. But we knew that they, that was not going to be sustainable for a long time because they were coming for the first year they were coming and we were not giving them anything. They were just learning. And then the second year, like, we are like, man, they're here all day, every day. Uh, what do they eat? We started giving them like $20 every end of the month. And we, we, we realized this is not enough and it's not sustainable. And so when we were thinking about how to sustain it, that's when Zain started looking into how can we keep this, how, how can we make it sustainable? And he approached different people, was walking to Whole Foods like uh, every week, wanting to sell the bags in there. So, but instead of getting to sell bags, we got a connection of uh, sending teams to Kenya. So Whole Foods said, yeah, we are not gonna buy your bags, but we can send teams because we source coffee and tea from Kenya and we send people to countries where we source products. So we, we were blessed that way that uh, Whole Foods started coming. So when they came, they met the children with special needs, they met the mothers, they fell in love. They said, we need to look for ways to collaborate. And that's when they challenged us to come up with a different kind of a product. We, we started making coffee sleeves. Like when you buy coffee, you put a carton so that you don't burn your, your, your fingers. And yeah, we said, we can make a coffee sleeve from fabric. And we did that. And they, they bought the first lot of uh, so many coffee sleeves and we were so excited uh, to get into Whole Foods and to sell our products there. So quite amazing. So Whole Foods, the US-based company, yeah. food stores, yeah. played a very instrumental role yeah. in helping Ubuntu yeah. get focused on creating things that you could sell, right? So that there was a 
stream of income exactly that you didn't have prior to that yes yes and i'm wondering how has it expanded or grown from those initial experiences with whole foods uh yeah it has grown quite a bit because uh, the women now from making things we couldn't show anybody to making very high end products uh we have uh, made bags that are very high end uh uh, if you go to our website, you can see all these things. And we make bracelets that people love to wear. We also are making shoes. So they are making very, very high-end products. And this came about because of the, the, the introduction by Whole Foods. So you have found other people like Nordstrom uh, made uh, bracelets for them for their Valentine. We call them Love Bracelets. Done amazing. Uh, and now we just call them message bracelets because different customers request for different words on their bracelets. There will be peace, there will be love and, and, and hope, different kinds of messages that we create. And so it has been quite amazing. It has opened many doors for us. And now we work with a group called Zazo. They custom make products. And yeah, they helped uh, helped us to start making custom made shoes and uh, selling them through their online platform. And that has helped us to grow quite a bit, yeah. So on an annual basis, what do you estimate the sales to be? In an annual basis, I would say 2019 will be a reflective of, uh, because our budget will be like $1 million US dollars per year. Half of that would come from the revenue, from the sale of products. And then the other half, we have to talk to donors to, to support the, the work that we do. And then 2020 came COVID. And COVID came, we were not doing so much of online sales. And our online sales kind of went up very high, which has been amazing. And that's when we also separated the business to the foundation and the foundation primarily takes care of children with special needs. And now the business can run like a business with all the efforts and everything like a business. And we can also invite now investors to come and invest in the business, which we couldn't do when we were still running it like a nonprofit. So that, that has worked well for us. And uh, from a diversification or geography standpoint, where do most of the sales come from? The sales? The major, majority of the sales are in the U.S. U.S. is our major market. And right now that we are doing e-commerce, we are seeing different people from all over the world be able to purchase items. We are actually trying to grow our e-commerce, making sure that when somebody orders a product from Kenya, it's shipped to them direct from Kenya so that it gets to them in a timely manner. So we are working on all those logistics. We also do local sales in Kenya. We, we are working on growing that because it's, it's not very, very high at the moment. And working on the price points as well because price points also, some people say it's an expensive bag and we say, yeah, it's hard made. <laughs> <laughs> so it takes a lot to be able to get it to, to that uniqueness. And it's also for a good cause, we say. <laughs> yeah, well, it's a win-win situation. You're creating unique handmade products, and they're supporting an important mission, right? Which goes beyond just, you know, making a profit, right? Some people think of it as a double bottom line, exactly. right? You know, the business is sustainable, yeah. but it's also benefiting a large group of individuals who would not otherwise, you know, benefit. So Exactly, exactly. Yeah, well, I love the mission of your organization. I purchased one of those bracelets that has the word Ubuntu on it. Yeah. And as I understand it, it means I am because we are. Yes. The interconnectedness of humanity. We we are all connected. Whatever you are doing in the US, whatever we are doing in Kenya, we impact one another without knowing. And so that keeps us united. We say Ubuntu is not just a philosophy, it's a lifestyle. We need to live united. We need to live, be there for each other. And, and it's not handout, it's a, it's a handshake. It's like we, we, you come with your expertise, I come with my, my, my expertise, and we join hands and we do great things. Yeah, well, I love it. The bug bit me, and yeah. I imagine that I will be singing your praises for the rest of my life. We appreciate that. We appreciate that. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. 
So I'm thinking about advice now because you've been around the world of special needs for decades. Yeah. And I'm wondering what advice that you can offer parents, especially dads, about raising a child with disabilities. That's a big one. When I hear dads of children with special needs, I remember a dad who has been passionate not many dads would bring their children to the center, but this gentleman, his daughter's name was Patience, and he would carry him on his arms every day. She couldn't walk by that time when she was coming to the center, and this dad would always come. The dad saw the beauty in, in this child, and with lots of appreciation and wanting to help this child with, live with dignity, he said, I am going to be the person who is going to do this. And, and that has been very touching for me and even for many other parents. We have heard him share his story with, with uh, many other parents and especially fathers. And he is like, this child is my child, needs to live with dignity like the other children, needs to be given opportunities just like others, even though the opportunities may be limited. And I need to work as hard as for this child as I work hard for, for the others. A very strong message because in Africa, I would say in Kenya, and I know in Africa, there is that stigma like uh, if you have a child with special needs, you are cursed and God is not happy with you and you, um, you must be punished. You, you are being punished for something that you did. And that stigma has made very many dads to be away from the parenting of their children with special needs. But I would encourage them, it's worth every effort. The smile from those children and even the appreciation that they have because they may not be able to utter the words thank you, but they look at you with a smile when you give them time. And it's, tell, it's all telling. It's like, yes, I love that you are here with me. And it's Ubuntu. We are there for each other. And so mine is to encourage the dads. It's like, yeah, it may be a difficult task. It is very challenging. And sometimes you don't even understand the reasons why. But I would say it's worth every effort. It's worth every effort. Yeah, well, thanks for sharing. What is Patience Dad's name? I want to say Joseph, but I don't want to be wrong. Okay. Well, I think more important than his name is what he stands for and the commitment that you described that he's made to his daughter and his philosophy about making sure that each one of his children, including this particular child, you know, lives with dignity and has opportunities. Yeah. And if it's not the parents who are looking out for their child, then who would really? Yeah. You know, anything we can do to destigmatize the aspect of growing up with differences is really important. Exactly. You know, not only there in Kenya, but here in the U.S. as well. Exactly. So is there anything else you'd like to say before we wrap up? I just appreciate uh, this opportunity to share with all those that will be listening to the interview. Yeah, that uh, we, we have an obligation as people who are blessed to reach out to others who may not be as blessed as we are or as able as we are and always be there for each other. That, that, that's what I would say. And there is a lot of hearts in the world. There's lots of challenges. But if we are there for each other, we alleviate the pain and we, we help each other walk the journey. And, and yeah, we, we just need to be there for each other. That's all I can say. We need to live Ubuntu in the whole world. Well, we're thrilled to have you as part of the Special Fathers Network. Thank you for your involvement. Thank you so much. If somebody wants to learn more about Ubuntu or to contact you, what would be the best way to do that? You can reach us online. We have two websites, one for the foundation, and that is UbuntuLife.Foundation. And if you wanted to purchase anything from our sister organization, Ubuntu Life, you just go to Ubuntu.Life. And from there, you can be able to get a hold of us. And there are also our phone numbers are all there in the website. You can be able to write an email. And uh, yeah, we'll be, we'll be happy to connect and to share the, the, the efforts and also the challenges of, that we are going through. Well, we'll be sure to include the email as well as the websites yes. in the show notes. So it'll make it as easy as possible for people to contact you. Yes. Jeremiah, thank you for taking the time and many insights. As a reminder, Jeremiah is just one of the individuals who's part of the Special Fathers Network, a mentoring program for fathers raising a child with special needs. 
If you'd like to be a mentor father or are seeking advice from a mentor father with a similar situation to your own, please go to 21stCenturyDads.org. Thank you for listening to the latest episode of the Special Fathers Network Dad to Dad podcast. I hope you enjoyed the conversation as much as I did. As you probably know, the 21st Century Dads Foundation is a 501c3 not-for-profit organization, which means we need your help to keep our content free to all concerned. Would you please consider making a tax deductible contribution? I would really appreciate your support. Jeremiah, thanks again. Yeah, thank you so much. All the best. And thank you for listening to the Special Fathers Network Dad to Dad podcast. The Special Fathers Network is a dad to dad mentoring program for fathers raising children with special needs. Through our personalized matching process, new fathers with special needs children match up with mentor fathers in a similar situation. It's a great way for dads to support other dads. To find out more, go to 21stCenturyDads.org. And if you're a dad looking for help or would like to offer help, we would be honored to have you join our closed Facebook group. Please go to Facebook.com groups and search Dad to Dad. Lastly, we're always looking to share interesting stories. If you'd like to share your story or know of a compelling story, please send an email to david at 21stCenturyDads.org. The Special Fathers Network Dad to Dad podcast was produced by me, Tom Couch. Thanks again to Horizon Therapeutics, who believe that science and compassion must work together to transform lives. That's why they work tirelessly to research, develop, and bring forward medicines for people living with rare and rheumatic diseases. Discover more about Horizon Therapeutics at horizontherapeutics.com.